Yeah, I don't think so. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm Lasse. I take popular Hollywood movies. I pit them against science and common sense. So if you're into that kind of thing and want a bit of critical thinking with your morning coffee, well, then you have come to the right place. Let's jump in to today's video. Seventeen thousand reasons why the wandering Earth is bullshit. That's about three nopes per second. That's a lot of nopes. It's not enough. Today I'm gonna focus on the inertial dampeners and what kind of a shitstorm you would actually face if you managed to stop the Earth from spinning. A lot of pretty awesome stuff happens because the Earth is spinning. You don't immediately die would be one of them. Anywho, it is now up to you to save the Earth and every third person on it. For some unexplained reason, you decide that it would be best to move the Earth rather than the people on it. Being the brilliant engineer that you are, you decide it would be best to stop the Earth spinning and take it out of the solar system. <laughs> Why well, did no one ever come up with that idea before? Let me know in the comments down below if you want to hear about why the kick is wrong. So, you carry out your plan and stop the Earth spinning. Let's go ahead and assume that this spin is reduced gradually over a period of time. Say a few years. After all, if you just slam the brakes, pretty much everyone would die, which would be eh, kinda not good, given that you try to save everyone. So what would happen if you gradually slow down the Earth spin? Well, to begin with, the shape of the Earth would change. You see, the Earth is actually not completely round. It is 40,075 kilometers around the equator, and from pole to pole, it is 40,008 kilometers. If you ask Euler, that means the radius of the Earth is 11-ish kilometers less at the poles than at the equator. Why is that important, you ask? Well, because the spin of the Earth creates a centripetal force that pushes water towards the equator, which accounts for the pole-equator diameter difference. If you stop the spin, you remove the centripetal force, and all the water on the Earth will do what water do best. Rush towards the lowest place, and it will stay there forever. As the poles are located about 11 kilometers lower than the equator, that's where the water will go. You now have two oceans separated by a huge landmass. The Mariana Trench becomes a salt lake in the middle of a gag gantuan mudplain that was once known as the Pacific Ocean. So that's not great. Unfortunately, that's the least of our problems. One side of our planet is now permanently facing the sun, which means that it's gonna get hot. Really hot. Like 100 plus degrees hot. On the shadow side, it's gonna get down to temperatures that are similar to the old Earth's poles. In winter times, we are looking at a permanent minus 50 degrees Celsius. Anyone familiar with the laws of thermodynamics, well, or just uh, weather in general, will know that a 150 plus degrees temperature difference will create one hell of a storm. More precisely, it will be a permanent storm blowing at hurricane strength from one side of the planet to the other forever. With the oceans at the poles and a permanent storm, our atmosphere is no longer distributed evenly around the globe. Oxygen will follow the oceans and be centered in the north and in the south. The middle part of the Earth will no longer be able to sustain life as we know it. Again, that's not great. At least if you consider yourself to be alive. What happens inside the Earth is even worse. You see, the inertial dampeners will only stop the spin of the Earth's crust, not the center. As you probably know, the Earth's mantle is liquid. That thing ain't stopping just because you're asking it nicely. It has rotational inertia, and a hell of a lot of it. The only way to slow it down is by friction with the Earth's crust. This friction will have enough power to rip continents apart and create new tectonic plates. We will have no way of predicting where an earthquake will hit, and there will be a lot of them. Another unfortunate effect of the mantle and core not spinning is that we will no longer have an electromagnetic field to protect us from the sun's deadly radiation. So, the migrating oceans will kill you, no food will kill you, no air will kill you, the storms will kill you, the radiation from the sun will kill you, the planet splitting earthquakes will kill you, and not subscribing to the channel will definitely kill you. You will not be able to survive on the surface, not even with fashion correct thermal equipment because, you know, one of all of the other reasons than cold will eventually get you. However, there is a slight chance that there might be a narrow band on a non-spinning earth where you possibly could survive. 
Maybe. And that is not enough to put a couple thousand mountain-sized planet-pushing engines on. But wait, I hear you say, apparently with a very squeaky voice. We've built bunkers where people can do hydroponics and be all cool and society-esque. Okay, fine, you nitpicking s***. Let's talk about that for a minute, shall we? I'll leave out the earthquakes. I'll give you the food and the electricity you need for a millennium. I'll even accept that nothing will break for a thousand years. What will they breathe? I mean, nothing is producing oxygen anymore, and what's left is somewhere over the North and South Sea, where people most definitely is not hiding in bunkers underground. But if they did, they don't anymore. They're dead. They're pretty much stuck with two options. One, transport the existing air by tubes, or two, split water into hydrogen and oxygen. Both options are pretty much no-go for a very apparent reason. Humans need a lot of oxygen to survive, I know, what a revelation. Who would have known that, right? Very simplified, we need about 2 liters of air per second, which equates to a tad over 0.1 gram of oxygen. So let's take the first one. Let's assume that we want to build some kind of tube to transport air. Basically, it's just a big ventilation system. So, 3 billion people times 2 liters per second means we need about 6 billion liters or 6 million cubic meters per second. Let's assume that we're transporting air at the speed of sound and that friction and mass and earthquakes and shock waves and oxygen reacting with everything is not a problem. Then we would need a tube 150 meters in diameter. If we cut the speed down to a tenth, which is a more reasonable but still pretty high, then the tube would be about 500 meters or half of a kilometer in diameter. If the air was moving at natural gas pipeline speeds, then the tube would be... <laughs> 1.1 kilometers in diameter, that's, um, that's an impractically big tube. But what if we instead decided to use electrolysis to split water into oxygen and hydrogen? Would that make it more feasible? Well, no it wouldn't. 3 billion people breathing 0.1 gram of oxygen every single second would require 300 metric tons of oxygen. And that is 300 metric tons of oxygen per second. It costs about 18 kilojoule of energy to get 1 gram of oxygen through electrolysis. So we would need to produce about 5.4 terawatts just to breathe. And that's about half the world's current energy consumption. It's not impossible. It's not impossible. Fuck it. Let's move the damn thing. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video half as much as I did making it, I have another one for you that I think you might like. It's here. To my left, the YouTube gods are in command and I take no responsibility for that except for the content.